our children are killing each other. I'm Kathy Adams. Join me for a revealing half hour, Kids Killing Kids, Friday evening at 7.30. Good evening. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Japan's Prime Minister came to Washington today. The House of Representatives greeted him with passage of a tough new trade bill. President Reagan greeted him by urging again that Japan stop protecting its own markets while exploiting those of others. Bill Plant reports. President Reagan and Prime Minister Nakasone of Japan were all smiles in public, but in private, Nakasone immediately pressured the president to lift trade sanctions which the U.S. recently imposed on selected Japanese exports. I see it as a very sore thorn that is sticking in, uh, in a small finger. We have to remove that thorn as soon as possible. Mr. Reagan says that's what he wants, too. But not until he's certain Japan is abiding by the agreement on computer chips, which the U.S. says it violated. As we've learned, progress will not happen on its own. We would like to see Japan, for example, open its markets more fully to trade and commerce. Nakasone offered at least one economic move, telling Mr. Reagan he had instructed his central bank and finance ministry to lower interest rates in order to stimulate Japan's economy, a move the administration has encouraged. Anything that stimulates markets abroad is good news for uh, uh, American workers and American products. But Japanese sources suggested Nakasone's instruction had actually been more like a polite request. And a senior U.S. official observed, language is a great convenience. The prime minister ended his day with a trip to Capitol Hill just as the House passed a tough trade bill designed to narrow the huge U.S. trade deficit. One section calls for mandatory sanctions on nations, including Japan, which use unfair trade practices. We must do something to show them that we expect to be treated fairly, that we expect them to play by the same rules that we do. Nakasone took the unusual step for a foreign leader of issuing a statement criticizing the House trade bill, which President Reagan had already promised to veto if it gets through the Senate. As for the sanctions, the White House predicted that the most Nakasone will get after his final meeting with the president tomorrow is another promise they'll be lifted when the trade numbers show Japan abiding by its agreement with the U.S. Bill Plant, CBS News, the White House. The Federal Reserve Board has tightened the nation's overall money supply. This was confirmed today by Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker. The move is aimed at curbing inflation's rise at home and slowing the dollar's fall abroad. Military prosecutors were back in court today trying to make their case against Marines accused of selling out their country in return for sexual favors from Soviet women agents. Defense Department correspondent David Martin reports the trouble in making the charges stick. Corporal Arnold Bracy, one of two Marines accused of giving the KGB access to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow, went back before a military judge today amid increasing signs that the case against him and other Marines suspected of espionage is falling apart. Navy Secretary James Webb sent a memo to Defense Secretary Weinberger this morning saying, quote, obtaining evidence in this case is not easy. Bracy's lawyers appear confident. We haven't heard anything that's shocking or astounding to us and uh, remain very optimistic about uh, Mr. Brace's chances. Another Marine suspect, John Joseph Wyrick, may never be charged because Pentagon officials say they cannot corroborate his own confession that he gave KGB agents access to the U.S. consulate in Leningrad. Lawyers for a third Marine, Sergeant Clayton Lone Tree, say Navy investigators coerced and distorted the testimony of some of the Marine suspects. Today, the Pentagon denied that charge. All the interrogations and interviews that have been conducted have been uh, in full compliance with the subject's rights, and uh, uh, I know of uh, no reason to believe that any subject was coerced or badgered in any way. Members of Congress today asked why only the Marines are being investigated, and the Attorney General revealed that an inquiry has begun into whether State Department personnel at the embassy in Moscow are guilty of any crimes. At this point, it's an inquiry yeah. to determine uh, both primarily from an administrative standpoint whether criminal action should be uh, invoked. The hearing to determine whether Bracey will be court-martialed has recessed until the middle of next month. Despite all the difficulties, Pentagon officials insist there will be courts martial for Marines suspected of espionage. David Martin, CBS News, the Pentagon.
More of Oliver North's secret wheelings and dealings from the White House basement came out today in FBI Director William Webster's testimony before Congress. Webster is seeking confirmation as the new CIA director. He testified that North in 1985 was suckered by a phony Saudi Arabian prince who offered to raise $14 million for Nicaraguan rebels. Upshot of the deal, the phony prince took North and his operatives for $200,000. As for the phony Saudi prince, he turned out to be an Iranian national. He's now doing time for bank fraud. The Internal Revenue Service today revoked the tax-exempt status of Carl Channel's group. That's the ideologically motivated group used as a front for illegal fundraising to send arms to Nicaraguan rebels. Yesterday, Channel copped a plea, named Oliver North as co-conspirator, and pleaded guilty to tax fraud conspiracy. Today, President Reagan had his spokesman say, quote, it is the legal view of the White House that the president is not part of this conspiracy, unquote. Mr. Reagan has praised Channel in the past and met with some of the people Channel hit up for contributions. The White House spokesman said today, President Reagan wasn't aware of how the money was really being spent. Family and friends of Benjamin Linder flew to Nicaragua today to bury the first American volunteer working for the Sandinistas killed by the U.S.-backed Contras. Juan Vasquez is there. For Ben Linder's family and girlfriend, it was a painful journey to the country that he gave his life for. He didn't go there because it was dangerous. He went there because it was needed. He knew it was dangerous. The family was met by the foreign minister and by the president's wife. For Nicaragua's government, Linder's death focuses new attention on controversial U.S. support for the Contra movement that has now taken an American life. And the death has also focused new attention on the Americans who live and work here in support of the Nicaraguan Revolution. The rebels call them collaborators. The government calls them internationalists. Linder's dream was to bring electricity to the dusty villages of the north where he spent his last year. Instead, he found a war. His home was simply furnished, but decorated in the colors of the Sandinista Revolution. Americans who come here to work <clears throat> all come uh, with the realization that the policies of the United States towards Nicaragua are criminal and immoral. The internationalists earn little or nothing working on projects to improve the lives of the long impoverished peasants. Some come for short periods, working on construction projects like hospitals or housing. Some bring health care to people who may never have seen a doctor. Some spend their lives here. In death, Ben Linder has already become a powerful symbol for the Sandinistas. Today, President Ortega himself joined the grieving family to bury Ben Linder in the Nicaraguan countryside he loved. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, Managua. The mother of seven-year-old Ronnie De Sillers said her son fought like a champion before he died last night while awaiting a fourth liver transplant. Maria De Sillers said her child fought to hang on until the very last minute when she told him it's all right to relax. Ronnie's case attracted the attention of President Reagan and thousands of others. U.S. federal health officials today said tuberculosis cases in this country are up significantly for the first time in 34 years. And the report said the spread of AIDS may be partly to blame. AIDS destroys the body's ability to fight disease, including TB. The growing menace of AIDS is spurring demand for drugs to fight the deadly disease, and that's meant a change in U.S. federal testing procedures even for medicines aimed at other killers. The risks and rewards of that change are the subjects of this report from CBS News correspondent John Blackstone. Americans whose lives are threatened by disease, whether they are children with cancer or people with AIDS, may soon be allowed to buy promising but still unproven experimental drugs. The Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, is considering cutting as much as three years off its testing requirements to get new drugs to the dying sooner. The move is widely viewed as a victory for what might be called the AIDS lobby. Its protests over a few months seem to have moved the FDA farther, faster than has a decade of pressure by some cancer researchers. This trickling of uh, uh, new drug development uh, would not have been changed if it hadn't been for a vigorous and outspoken lobby that says we want access to new drugs. The commissioner of the FDA says the change is not solely a response to AIDS but rather an attempt to show compassion for the dying, no matter what their disease. It's very hard to look someone in the eyes and say, I know you're going to die, I've got a drug that could help you, but it's not quite approved, 
please come back and see me a while later. But even within the AIDS lobby, there is not universal approval for the change, largely because the new rule will allow companies to sell drugs before effectiveness has been fully established. Because there's a real potential for profiteering here. Because what that essentially does is it requires people to pay for the privilege of being guinea pigs. But many Americans already pay for the privilege of being guinea pigs. They search the drug stores in places like Tijuana, Mexico, looking often desperately for remedies not available in the United States. I, I want to buy uh, 10 boxes. The big seller in Tijuana these days is ribavirin, an American-developed AIDS therapy that has shown early promise but hasn't yet made it through the long FDA regulatory process. I did resent having to sort of come across the border and you know, sort of cloak and dagger, sneaking around, wondering whether you're going to be stopped by the uh, immigration officials at the border. Uh, especially for something that's so important. There are fears that easing the testing regulations will open the doors to quackery or to drugs that turn out to do more harm than good. But the change will also provide hope that is now often found only beyond the border. John Blackstone, CBS News, Tijuana. Upcoming on tonight's CBS Evening News, the deeply corrupting cocaine overdose in small town and rural America. And hey, why is this man doing baseball play-by-play -play for the Chicago Cubs? Today it's baseball, the Cubs, and the Expos. Did you know the last time you starved yourself to lose fat, you might have lost muscle? Why? You didn't eat enough protein. Protein helps you keep the muscle while you lose fat. And that's what's special about Kellogg's Special K. It has the highest level of dietary protein of any cereal. So the under 200 calorie Special K breakfast may help you get the fat off and keep the muscle on. Special K. Keep the muscle. Lose the fat. Know what I'm doing? <laughs> feeding my lawn. You know what I'm doing now? I'm feeding my lawn. Yep, I'm still feeding my lawn. And look at my thick green lawn. It loves what it's eating. New Hypenex Lawn Fertilizer. Hypenex is higher in essential nutrients and a leading national brand. And its time-release formula keeps your lawn greener longer. Guaranteed. What am I doing now? Feeding, feeding your lawn. lawn! No, I'm feeding my dog. Try new Hypenex lawn products today. You've probably heard about pain relievers that sound new. But they're not new to hospitals. For years, hospitals have known about ibuprofen, aspirin, and Tylenol products. And today, their overwhelming choice, Tylenol. Shouldn't your choice be Tylenol, too? Just a sprinkle a day helps keep odor away. Shower to shower regular, Spice and Morning Fresh help you keep that just showered feeling from one shower to the next. Have you had your sprinkle today? The latest indication tonight of just how wide and how deep the illegal narcotics network has spread in this country and how corrupting it is. Recent big deal federal drug indictments in small town North Carolina. Bill Whitaker reports from one county among many caught in heavy traffic. 35 people indicted since January, 19 this week, swept up in a federal investigation of big time drug trafficking in rural Robeson County, North Carolina. Investigators call the drug trade here a multi million dollar business. The only other place in America you can buy cocaine as high a purity and as at lower price is Miami. Robeson is a poor farming county with high unemployment. It straddles Interstate 95, the main north-south artery on the East Coast, a highway dubbed Cocaine Alley for the heavy drug traffic from Florida to the Northeast. Investigators and residents say cocaine is flooding Robeson County. Over half the people I'd say in Lumsden does cocaine. It's in the schools, it's in the, on the street, it's in trailers, house, uh, mobile homes, it's in the mansions, it's everywhere. At a recent sentencing, we had a school board member talk about a fifth grader who brought in some cocaine and shared it with his friends. Now, there are allegations that drugs and drug money have compromised county law enforcement. More than a pound of cocaine is missing from the sheriff's evidence locker. And citizens were outraged when Deputy Kevin Stone, son of the county sheriff, shot and killed an unarmed drug dealer. A hastily called inquest cleared the deputy. The victim's family calls it a whitewash. It's something like 13 or 14 unsolved murders here in Robeson County right now. And most of them is 
drug related. Don't take no more! Don't take no more! Last week, 2,000 residents protested the killing and called for clean government. Sheriff Hubert Stone says his department is clean and is doing its best. They know that I'm doing my job, and I'm going to keep on doing it as long as I'm here. Still, federal investigators describe Robison as a county out of control, and they promise even more drug indictments in the near future. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Lumberton, North Carolina. Does this sculpture of a cat look about 2,300 years old to you? It did to the experts. What the experts are saying today says a lot about a problem plaguing collectors and museums across the country. Charles Osgood explains. The cat is supposed to be an ancient Egyptian bronze dating back to 300 years before Christ. That's what the Metropolitan Museum in New York thought it had bought in 1958. If anything, it now admits, Kitty might be a little too pretty. The only thing you could say is when an object appears to be so utterly attractive and ravishing, and you look at it very carefully, we're always suspect of things that are on the surface too pretty. Beauty is only skin deep. And these days, when museums decide to look at something very carefully, there's an arsenal of scientific testing methods to help. Dallas Museum officials announced just last week that this and two other supposedly pre-Columbian pieces appear to have been made in the 1950s. The St. Louis Museum then tested 12 of theirs and found to their horror that three were fakes. Some critics are highly skeptical about an ancient Greek sculpture of Kouros, recently acquired by the Getty Museum in Malibu, California. The museum insists it's the genuine article. There are only seven or eight known in the world, and I questioned the piece um, because it appears to me a, a composite. And when subjected to what you might call a cat scan, the Met's popular cat turns out to contain too much lead, and its corrosion is too superficial to date from 300 B.C. 1955 A.D. seems more like it. And a lot of that happened in the 50s. The 50s was a golden age for the forger. Those things are now coming under very close scrutiny. So if the experts and authorities, the critics and curators can be hoodwinked, there's a lesson there for everybody else. Well, if you buy in haste, you may repent at leisure. Most art forgeries are detected sooner or later, but forgers know that you can fool some of the people some of the time, and that's all they need. Charles Osgood, CBS News, New York. Today, millions of miracle Grow gardeners are getting wonderful results with this amazing invention, the miracle Grow no-clog garden feeder. It's the fastest, easiest feeder I've ever used. Well, now you can use it to feed your lawn, because now there's new miracle Grow lawn food. It makes lawn care so easy, just drop in and spray on. You'll feed your whole lawn in minutes. You'll see lush green results in days. New miracle Grow lawn food. For a miracle Grow lawn, you'll be proud of. Want to know what Old English Oil can do for your paneling? Look, Old English Oil moisturizes to help prevent drying and cracking. It helps bring out the beauty of wood. And gives a rich, natural glow to all your furniture. Old English Oil. The stars are gonna twinkle and shine. How they shine this evening about a quarter to nine. I know I won't be late all that half-ass day. I'm gonna hurry there. I'll be waiting where... The they say time is what you make it. At Citizen, we prefer making it beautiful. About a quarter to nine. Citizen. Troubled by bad breath? Then have a Milk Bone Dog Biscuit to help scrape away plaque and food particles to give you cleaner teeth, fresher breath. Get Milk Bone because, naturally, every dog wants fresher breath. For the third time in a week, South African police battled with white as well as black students on university campuses. The demonstrations were called to protest next week's parliamentary elections, which are for whites only. Leaders of the country's voteless black majority have called for a mass protest against the elections next Wednesday, but as Martha Teichner reports tonight, the white minority government is also under fire from some of those who can vote. 
In a hall with 600 seats, 34 people have come to hear F.W. de Klerk, political ally of President P.W. Botha, and often mentioned as his likely successor, an off-night, or a sign that the ruling National Party, considered reactionary by the outside world, has become too liberal for a lot of white South Africans. The impact of the right is the wild card in South Africa's whites-only elections. The National Party, after 40 years in power, will not lose the election, but how far and how fast it can go with reform will depend on how successful it is at reining in the right. And if you give us that mandate, this government will be able to move faster towards... That's exactly what working class whites don't want. Barely clinging to the economic ladder, blacks are beginning to climb. They are terrified they will lose the remaining advantages of a white skin. My fears are that we'll be overrun by blacks as a father, and that means that I'm scared. Menar van der Merwe farms in the misty foothills of the eastern Transvaal. Last May, blacks burned his barns. Like most right-wing voters, he votes his fears. There is no such thing as a non-racial society in South Africa. Although badly splintered, the right wing was estimated going into the election campaign at 30% or more of South Africa's white vote. The government has literally brought out the big guns. It has placed them on college campuses on trains in response to railway violence, around the biggest black union hall. It has hit supposed ANC guerrillas across the border in Zambia. The question is, will the government's saber rattling drown out the increasingly popular message of Eugene Terblanche, a man whose name means white land, and whose organization, the neo-fascist Africana resistance movement, is said to be the fastest growing white political group in South Africa. When this cowardly government capitulates, he says, then we will take back South Africa by force for the white man. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Johannesburg. survey, a thousand doctors were asked if stranded in the middle of nowhere, which one medicine would they want along? Tylenol, extra strength Tylenol, Advil, or Bayer? Doctors chose Bayer, even more than last time. Now three to one over extra strength Tylenol, six to one over Advil. More doctors than ever chose Bayer. Shouldn't you? Bayer, the wonder drug that works wonders. surf and dress like that. Can't today. Going home. Home? Oh, I thought you were staying all week. Mom wanted ice cream last night. Dad couldn't find our money. What, did he lose it? Somebody stole it. I'm sorry. You will see you next summer, though, huh? Yeah. It could happen to you right here in the U.S., so don't carry cash. Carry American Express traveler's checks. Don't leave home without them. Metamucil works, but it's gritty. That's why we made Citrusel. Look, Metamucil's gritty, so it won't all go through the strainer. Citrusel's special fiber pours right through. Citrusel, great taste, no grit. This mouthwash is number one in hospitals with a powerful formula that kills germs that cause bad breath and germs that cause plaque buildup. With a refreshing non-medicine taste, this mouthwash is Sepacol. New York Mets pitching ace Dwight Gooden one day after being released from a drug treatment center today was back at the ballpark talking about his past and his future. Gooden is scheduled to rejoin the world champions June 1st. I know I made a mistake and I regret it a lot, but I must turn the page once again because life goes on and I want to put all this behind me so I can get back to doing things I like and that's playing baseball and having fun once again. Baseball, of course, is a game, and a man who helped make it fun was a legend when he broadcast baseball in St. Louis for a quarter of a century. He soared to new heights broadcasting Chicago White Sox games. And since 1982, when Harry Carey started broadcasting Chicago Cubs baseball, his cult has become something of a phenomenon. And now Frank Courier reports perhaps the most remarkable chapter yet in this baseball play-by-play -play odyssey. Let me hear ya! Like his ballpark serenade to the seventh inning stretch, Harry Carey is one of a kind. Take me out to the ball game. Take me that was last year, 
this season, something's been missing for most Cub fans. It's not the same as our Harry. He's the life and soul of the Cubs. The 70-year-old Kerry suffered a stroke in February and is now recuperating at his California home amidst mountains of fan mail. Hey, Harry, I'm glad we have you. Get well soon and get back to work. Meanwhile, the loud and lovable broadcaster has some competition back in the booth. A lot of class, pal, a lot of class. Since opening day, Chicago station WGN has tried to fill the void, recruiting celebrity Cub fans to be Harry for a day. Commentator George Will and columnist Mike Royko each had his day. So did comedian Bill Murray. I think with the help of the overrated and not such a big deal after all, Montreal Expos, the Cubs will triumph today. Murray showed no mercy for the visiting team. I hate to say this, but oh, gee, it was too bad he didn't slip and fall. Particularly the manager. Time for a visit from you-know-who. Come on out to the mound, you meathead. What this proves is that Andy Warhol was right. These are our 15 minutes, and we're going to enjoy them for Harry. Millions of Cub fans nationwide know the sound of a home run, Harry Carey style. There's a drive and a left field. For Harry, every time he walks into the park, it's like Christmas, and he's never lost that. Throughout Chicago, the Harry legend looms on billboards, banners, brick walls, and beer ads. Man, I'm a Cub fan! He's a Cub fan! And I'm a Cub fan! While the proxies in the booth have been both praised and panned by the public, Harry's absence has made believers out of the so-called bleacher bombs. We need him back. We really do. I mean, it put us on a winning streak again. We have no pitching. But if we got Harry, we got a shot. Harry Carey is due back May 19th. For some, not soon enough. Frank Courier, CBS News, Chicago. And that's the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather, thank you for joining us. Good night. Cadillac introduces Alante. There's a new spirit. There's a new excellence. It's a proud sense of achievement. A new spirit in driving. A new Cadillac. Alante. When you have arthritis, mornings can be nightmares. Some days it hurts just to put on a watch. Today, people are turning from aspirin to Advil for hours of relief from minor arthritis pain. Advil contains a non-prescription strength of ibuprofen, the medicine doctors have prescribed over 130 million times in prescription brands like Motrin. Advil works for hours, and that makes mornings much easier. Advil, tablets and new caplets, advanced medicine for pain. There's just too much being said about fiber and good health for me to ignore. I'm not taking any chances. I make sure they eat high-fiber foods, and I give them FiberGuard every day to help make sure they get all, not just some, of the fiber they need. FiberGuard, the new all-natural high-fiber supplement. Just a few with each meal gives you the same amount of fiber that's in 10 bowls of puffed wheat cereal. I'm the guardian of their health, and I take that job very seriously. at the Chicago Board of Trade. Longer hours help them go global to meet the competition from abroad. Ken Pruitt reports tomorrow on the CBS Morning News. This is CBS.